some of the, um, the, uh, the alfinator uh, project will uh, transfer the best practices from uh, more advanced uh, countries like Northern and, and Western Europe to less, uh, less advanced markets in the, in the alternative financing. We'll implement a capacity, a capacity building a strategy uh, for uh, SMEs, uh, alternative financing providers and other stakeholders. And we'll uh, eventually, ultimately, the goal is to improve SMEs access uh, in alternative uh, forms of financing. Uh, where are we targeting? As I said, our focus is more on the South, uh, Central and, and Eastern Europe. So the, we are targeting our activities in eight countries, which are uh, Spain, Italy, uh, Lithuania, Portugal, of course, uh, Slovakia, Hungary, and Romania. And sorry, I, I, I skipped the guy with the question marks. Uh, so how are we going to do this? Um, the alternator main tools and activities, I can briefly uh, uh, present them. We have our website, the web platform, uh, where you can now uh, access to relevant resources uh, that can be useful for SMEs like uh, the Alfinator country hubs. We are developing areas uh, per country, and the countries that I mentioned before, where there will be relevant information f about those countries, um, uh, success cases uh, in their respective languages. Um, we have uh, the interactive map where, you, where we have 230 alternative financing providers that you can find in this interactive map. Uh, we are developing uh, a matchmaking tool where SMEs and alternative financing providers can, uh, bring, uh, can be uh, brought together uh, uh, towards uh, similar needs and synergies. Uh, we have uh, the, um, uh, a credit data assessment where we try to make available for the alternative financing providers uh, information uh, about uh, SMEs in terms of credit uh, and other type of information. And then we have useful, useful resources. We, at this moment, we have a re, um, the regulatory frameworks of all the countries that I mentioned that you can check out, check it out. Um, we have best practices for uh, each uh, of the um, countries, also success, success, success cases. We have uh, an alternative financing, financing invest, investors manual, which is uh, tips, uh, which are tips for uh, how to invest in alternative financing. Um, so there are uh, hopefully a lot of information there that can be interesting for you. Uh, we also in the project are organizing events. This uh, workshop is, uh, is part of a series of workshops that are, that are taking place around Europe, uh, organized by the, by, by the other partners. Uh, this uh, workshop, uh, um, the objective is to create awareness about alternative financing, to bring together different stakeholders and to talk about these subjects. We have international workshops with the objective of uh, presenting best practices. Um, we have uh, public roundtables, again, to bring together different stakeholders and to have different perspectives um, in the same uh, room. And we have a policymaker um, hearing well, that we will bring evidence-based information to policymakers to hopefully take decisions based on the information pro we provide that can uh, improve and support the, the alternative financing ecosystem. The online, online actions, the uh, online activities, we have um, currently under development massive uh, open online uh, courses or MOOCs will be very shortly available and we will promote it in the website and the social networks. Some of the topics uh, that you may be interested in are, uh, al that will be addressed in these MOOCs are the alternative financing facts and figures, um, success cases on the different types of alternative financing, uh, the legal and regulatory uh, framework uh, for, for investing, and uh, the marketing strategies related to, to successful uh, fundraising, and many other topics that didn't have a space to put it in the slide. Um, we also have webinars. Um, the webinars are uh, thought as a coaching mentoring session more practical for SMEs or alternative financing providers uh, to improve their um, 
competences or their skills in, in when dealing with this alternative financing. Uh, actually, uh, this may be of your interest. We have a webinar coming up on uh, um, the th June 13th. It's organized by our Spanish partner, Zavala. And it's, uh, uh, the topic will be how to use equity for crowdfunding for financing innovative SMEs. And it will be from 1.30 to uh, 12.30, one hour. The information is on our website. <clears throat> uh, and then uh, just uh, to finish, uh, the expected outcomes of our projects is uh, to have uh, more alternative financing providers, uh, more funding uh, uh, available to SMEs, uh, increase the financial literacy uh, of, uh, of the society, uh, more successful and scalable businesses, um, ultimately contribute to the growth of the eco our economy and improve the regulatory conditions of uh, each country, respectively. So if you uh, are an um, alternative financing provider, or an SME, or an investor, or a regulator, uh, the information in, Alter in Alcinator can be of your interest, and we uh, will be grateful for you to follow us, and thank you very much. Just one more thing, uh, in your folders you have a questionnaire. Did you know the European projects, there are these uh, reporting procedures and we will appreciate if you fill the, in these uh, um, questionnaires and uh, give it to Katarina or my colleagues, there, me or Raquel. Thank you. Yeah. In, the, in the panel. Yeah, exactly. I, I just have a question mm -hmm. though. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that there are 240 uh, alternative finance providers. 30, 230. Okay, okay. Wow. but that's already quite a lot. Mm -hmm. But then your, one of your goals is to uh, get more alternative finance mm -hmm. providers. And uh, you, you have an idea how many would then, uh, how many would you like there to be to be it uh, successful? This has been a joint effort from the, from the consortium. Yes. This 230 has been a quite extensive desk research uh, from all the uh, partners mm -hmm. to search for uh, relevant uh, providers, financial yes. financing providers. And uh, we don't have a specific target, no. uh, but, but just more. we would like to, yeah, to have a, a broad. We are focusing also um, for now, more in these eight countries, in mm -hmm. our target countries, but we want to also outreach to yeah, other countries and uh, have yeah. exactly an European wide uh, coverage. Yeah, great. Okay. Yes. Yes. Sorry? It's, it's part of the 2020. 2020, yeah. Program. It will uh, finish in. Uh, it's a two-year project. It started in May 2018, so it will finish in 2020. Exactly. Yes. More questions? Okay. Um, yeah, let's there's, there's one more question. So oh, sorry. Ones in the slide where you mentioned all these alternative financing uh, issues, are these going to be a subject of discussion? We are not going through all, but uh, there are some uh, speakers here that represent a uh, few of them and will provide information about some of these. Okay. Not all, there are a lot, but Thank some. You. Yeah, that's the, um, that's the aim of the first panel and uh, I would like to, uh, to start with the first panel is to, uh, to get an overview of uh, um, well, the alternative finance that is uh, there. And we invited um, alternative finance providers to come and uh, share uh, what they can do for SMEs. And uh, maybe we can start uh, with the first speaker. The idea is that uh, the, f the alternative finance providers that are invited will first present themselves, and then uh, uh, you all get a chance to ask them questions. And when uh, all have um, uh, presented themselves, we will have a, a 
later a panel discussion with all of them uh, together. Okay, so uh, I believe now <coughs> the first speaker uh, will come to us via technology, right? The first speaker is uh, Pedro Domingos from um, uh, PPL, the crowdfunding platform. And um, is he here? Pedro, can you hear us? Um, from the God, I have. I have some problems listening back, uh, so there are several seconds gap, uh, but I hope you're he hearing me well. Uh, can you confirm? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you well enough, I think. Uh, what do you think? Yeah. Okay, we hear you well enough. Welcome. Great to, uh, to have you here uh, with your voice at least. Uh, could you give oh. us... Uh, uh, an introduction of yourself and what PPL is doing for SMEs in, um, in Portugal? Mm. Uh, well, I, I will assume you can hear me because I can hear you back. But uh, as, as, far, uh, as, as long as you can hear me, that's, that's fine. Um, so uh, thank you for the invitation to be talking about crowdfunding. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not able to attend physically, but I'm just recovering from a surgery and I'm not able to travel to Alvaro. Um, but uh, we'll hope uh, we can do it via Skype. Um, so my presentation is about crowdfunding. Um, uh, for those who don't know what crowdfunding is, um, let's start with the beginning, with the basic. So uh, it's about uh, raising funds to a, a project. Um, normally it's done uh, with many funders or backers uh, that contribute with uh, small amounts. Um, and what differentiates crowdfunding from other um, ways to raise funds uh, like this is that it's done mainly, uh, primarily via internet. So uh, the entrepreneurs, the, the campaign owners now have the social media tools and, and internet tools to reach a more broad audience. And this is done uh, since 2008, roughly, sometimes even earlier than that. Um, and um, there are several types of crowdfunding, for those who don't know. Uh, just a quick uh, overview, because probably some of you are already acquainted with this. But um, the first um, crowdfunding um, uh, model is via donation and reward, and that's what PPL, our platform, uh, operates with. Uh, you probably know about Kickstarter and Indiegogo, so they are the largest players in this area. And in this type of crowdfunding, backers uh, receive uh, normally a reward uh, uh, related with the project. So for the entrepreneur, it's, it, it works like a pre-sale. Uh, they uh, present the, the project, the idea to the public, and those who back or invest can uh, receive uh, a product or a service related with the project. Then there are other types of crowdfunding with financial return. Uh, the first one being lending. Um, so we have in Portugal uh, the example of RAISE and also of GoParity. So uh, RAISE, is, it, it works as um, a business loan to SMEs, whereas GoParity is more uh, uh, energy-focused uh, project. And then there's Zopa and Funding Circle uh, International. Uh, there's also equity crowdfunding, and there's also a Portuguese uh, platform. Uh, at least they have uh, headquarters in, in, in Lisbon, which is CIDA, um, and, there, and also Crowdcube in England, in UK. Um, so there are many types of crowdfunding. This is just the three major uh, ones, but uh, what we have witnessed recently is that there are a lot of models and hybrid models uh, starting to work uh, across Europe and across the, the, the world. Just to get you uh, a rough idea what what is the numbers we are working in Portugal, in PPL, we've raised more than 4 million euros for more than 1,000 campaigns. And this was as, uh, what was possible uh, thanks to more than 100,000 backers um, contributed to all these campaigns. Um, the average campaign raises roughly 3,500 3, euros, 
Uh, if you if you ch check the statistics of Kickstarter, for example, it's roughly the same average uh, with 50 backers per campaign. What is different different in, in in Kickstarter is that they have some outliers that can raise more than 10 or 15 million euro uh, dollars, um, and that's what brings the headlines headlines in the, in the newspapers. But we get we are getting there. I hope we we achieve that. Um, the, we have all kinds of, so, of projects, so we have uh, entrepreneurship, it's right in the middle of the, 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 the table. Um, we wish there were more entrepreneurial uh, thoughts, but the, the gross majority is from uh, a cultural projects, so music, books, um, uh, sh uh, short movies and theatre plays uh, are the, the, the top are in the top five categories in PPL. Um, I also want, wanted to share with you some of the recent Cambridge uh, report findings. Um, uh, this is the, the growth in, in, in volume raised through crowdfunding and alternative financing models. Um, it, it's been growing uh, a lot and this is only in Europe. And Europe represents a tiny portion of all the global investment uh, behind the US, and by far the largest market is Asia, namely China. Um, and in Europe, this is including the UK, which is also the top, uh, top country. Um, with Brexit, they'll be on their own and they'll be fine which, in which relates to crowdfunding. Um, and if we check the continental Europe uh, by country, we can see that Portugal is, uh, surprise, surprise, uh, in the, in the tail. Um, but let's view this as a positive uh, outlook. Uh, we still have uh, too much to grow. Uh, there's, there's market to grow. Uh, so we hope that platforms uh, come and operate here, namely uh, real estate ones. Um, but we still have a lot to go. Uh, we are we're not uh, a small country uh, if we compare with Slovakia or Lithuania. So we we, we must uh, grow uh, in the, in the volume of alternative finances. If we check which uh, types of crowdfunding are um, more active, uh, the first one is peer-to-peer -peer consumer lending. So uh, people that um, in Borrow, lend money to other uh, individuals that wish to to buy some uh, appliance or take a trip or a medical um, have a medical um, uh, surgery, for example. So it's it's the number one in in, in volume, uh, followed by invoice trading, which is growing um, for the last year. So in invoice trading, uh, investors uh, advance the money for invoices that uh, companies want, will be receiving later on by their clients. So if um, a wine supplier uh, sells wine to Continent or uh, Auchan, they will get paid in 90 days or 200 days. And with this invoice trading, they, they can get some of a part of, of that invoice more uh, fast, faster than uh, waiting for the whole 90 days or 120 days. Uh, and then, as you can see, there's other types of crowdfunding. Uh, real estate is, is in, in, in fourth place. Then equity, rewards, peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, and so on. Uh, but perhaps this is the, the most important slide that I have now, for, for at least for entrepreneurs, because crowdfunding is a lot more than just financing or funding. Uh, it allows, uh, first and foremost, uh, for the entrepreneur to test their product. Um, it's not uh, an intention or a research uh, questionnaire. It, it's, it's presenting the real project or product to the world and see if the backers, if the people are interested in, in, in that and if they actually buy or pre-buy the, the product. 
Um, so it's it's very it's it's a very important uh, tool for the an entrepreneur because uh, in in the traditional way they would have to finance the the, the project from their own uh, pocket or uh, at least get a loan from a traditional uh, uh, method and then they will check if the market accepts the project or not. So there's a risk involved. In with crowdfunding you can. You can um, present the, the project to the people, to the to the world, and uh, if there's enough people interested, then fine, you get the funding. If not, uh, it's 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 not uh, uh, the best outcome, but it's it's also uh, more risk-free than the traditional way. So it's it's a very important way to get your first customers, your ambassadors, uh, and and get feedback from the public, from the crowd. It's also a way to, to do some pricing tests because defining a, the pricing for a product is not always uh, easy. So if you put it too high, you, you, you risk not selling. Uh, if you put it too low, then you're leaving money on the table. So with crowdfunding and with the reward tires, uh, you can add uh, or uh, specify several um, amounts for each tire and then check which has more um, uh, interest from the public. It's not easy. Uh, I'm, it's not a question of opening a, a page on the internet and the money gets pouring in into your laptop. It's not easy. Uh, but I mean, uh, being an entrepreneur, it requires some resilience uh, uh, from the team. So this is a first test of resilience to the team. Um, and finally, crowdfunding should not be seen as the exclusive way to get funding. It can be, um, it can be, it can work with other traditional methods such, such as a business, uh, a bank loan, or a, a VC or a business angel. In fact, it's I think it's much easier for a business angel to to invest in a project that already got got some funding through crowdfunding. Because it it shows that there's some traction and some interest from the crowd, um, instead of just investing uh, based on the team and the Excel and business plan. Um, so you should be looking at crowdfunding as a way to get funds, but also to test your your product on the market. And there are some tools for that. We we've come. We've we've. Uh, we are working with this crowdfunding canvas uh, that it's it's um, it's based on the, the the business model canvas that it's used traditional for entrepreneurs. So if you if you map all your assets, your team, your motivation, your uh, value proposition in a business model canvas, it's very easy to map them into a crowdfunding canvas, which will in turn be. Uh, Transformed in in in, in the, the campaign page that the crowd will see. So if you if you already come up with a business model canvas, it's very natural and direct to um, build a crowdfunding campaign on top of that. So it's not uh, an extra work that you will have to do. Um, it's it's again it's a way to test and to do a real test on on your hypothesis and your uh, model. I mean, this is this was a very short presentation. I hope you get uh, you are now more acquainted with crowdfunding. If you do have any questions, I'm free to to uh, as far as technology allows, I'm free to 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 answer some of the questions on a later stage. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you so much. We've all listened to you. Um, I I wonder. Um, well, first of all. Uh, can we make sure all the uh, attendees get the slides? I think they're very informative. So uh, that that been said, you all will get the uh, the slides. But are there questions? Well, you did a re yes. Sorry, did you? No, I thought you did. Okay. No, this was a very clear uh, presentation. Um, I, I just have a, a short question. You, you showed the overview of the volume in um, uh, Europe of crowdfunding, and this was included uh, with the UK. 
Are you still there? Okay. Well, my question was, um, um, is he still here? <laughs> yes. Pedro, can you hear me? I'm not sure. Okay. Well, I wanted to ask him uh, uh, what the slide looks like um, uh, without uh, the UK. And I know the answer a little because uh, uh, the UK was re responsible for almost uh, I'm not, I don't know the direct, the exact number, but it was like a responsible for almost 80% of the volume uh, of crowdfunding in, in Europe. So um, the growth of it and the, the volume was uh, uh, mainly based on, uh, on, on um, English uh, numbers. Um, okay, uh, I think we uh, well, we'll uh, proceed to the next uh, speaker to speed it up a little. This was crowdfunding or uh, reward-based crowdfunding, um, which can be interesting uh, uh, if you want to validate your, uh, your product. And this is a good start to, uh, uh, to start your business. And uh, this is also a good validation for next investors that uh, you can then prove, OK, we did a successful crowdfunding campaign. People like our product. People like our company. We are able to gather a lot of people around us. And now we're ready for uh, the bigger money. So that's, uh, it's always a good start uh, of, your, uh, of your company, if the product is uh, consumer-based, of course. OK, the next speaker is uh, Helena. And uh, I uh, want to introduce you. you good morning. I'm talking about the Portugal Bank as mm -hmm. we speak. This yeah. is a kind of a traditional alternative uh -huh. financing. Yeah, very important. Yes. yes. Okay, I'm looking forward to your presentation. And uh, you, uh, you will do it in uh, Portuguese, right? Oh, that's so nice of you. And after that, I'll shift to Portuguese because yes, I'm talk I'll talk about uh, the initiatives, the yes, deal flow do. initiatives, no, and uh, is not so important no. for you, but uh, they, it no, could but be important for it, it members of the audience. Thank <laughs> you so much. And yes. for all of you, I really appreciate that you um, uh, listen to the English. I, I mean, I am here in your country. Maybe next time I should uh, uh, speak some Portuguese. No, okay, no, luck. no, no, you don't. <laughs> you don't need um, to do this effort. Good morning. Uh, it is, um, it is a, a great pleasure for Portugal Ventures to be present in this workshopping um, and, giving, and to give testimony of the, its contribution to the promotion of the Portuguese uh, entrepreneurship ecosystem through the financing of new companies uh, with high growth potential in the global market, especially startups in the technological and digital areas. Over the years, Portugal Ventures has been one of the most active players of the Portuguese startup ecosystem and has contributed to increase of the venture capital, uh, venture capital activity in Portugal. In 2017, Portugal Ventures was considered by CB Insights the most active VC investor in Portugal. Our mission is proactively invest in startups in all stages of development, helping them grow, increase their competitiveness, and growing globally. Since 2012, Portugal Ventures has evaluated more than 1,600 projects, has invested over uh, more than 120 million euros in almost 100 new uh, startups in tech, life sciences, and tourism uh, sectors. Portugal Ventures invests in four verticals, um, digital, life sciences, engineering and manufacturing, and tourism. We are a relevant <laughs> player in the tourism area and um, also, also in, in digital. 
Uh, in life sciences, we are also the major investor in uh, life science startups. Uh, we have lots of um, new startups in this area and we are the, the most active player there also. Um, we invest in all stages, uh, but especially in early stage and seed. Uh, sometimes we invest in Series A also, but uh, normally and mainly in companies of the portfolio alongside with co-investors. Uh, we only invest in Portugal, in uh, companies headquartered in Portugal and with relevant business in Portugal. This has to do with the, the sources of financing. We have limitations uh, in terms of the location of the companies. Even in Lisbon and Algarve, is not, or in the Madeira and the Azores, the islands, we cannot invest because our funds are funded by European funds through EFD, uh, the president is here, Enrique Cruz, and we have some limitations that uh, has to do with the negotiation of the European programs of financing. Our investment thesis, we invested in tickets between uh, 300,000 and 1.5 million, depending on sector and the stage. Uh, we favor the co-investment with Portuguese and international partners. Um, we hold a minority stake in the company share capital. We have a seat on the board of directors. And normally we do the investments gradually uh, by tranches um, that are made as each milestone is achieved uh, to reduce the risk. <laughs> um, Portugal Ventures, what we offer, we offer contact, a contact network with investors and strategic partners, um, know-how and track record in monitoring venture capital business, a team with relevant and specialized track record, and smart investments. We have protocols with the old incubators, the associations, the universities, the um, spin-off companies, uh, uh, intellectual property offices in the universities, and we have uh, partnerships with other VCs and uh, with other and with the business angels. Uh, I'll talk in later that we have also a protocol with Cedars, um, that is a crowd equity crowdfunding. And uh, we do some um, co-investments with them, investing in the same co in the same companies and co-investments. This is a, a very, a very virtuous and good partnership. And um, we have lots of investments also with business angels. They invest in the first stage, and uh, we come uh, with them in the following stage. And this is a very, very good cooperation and partnership. The investment process is, is, very, is very lean and simple. We have online application. We do the press screening in 15 working days. After that, we have a panel, an external panel with international and national experts. Uh, if the recommendation is to invest, we, we do an evaluation and uh, internal evaluation and a pitch to the Portugal Ventures Board uh, that decides to invest or not, normally decides to invest. And uh, in, uh, in, uh, within 90 days, we, we present a proposal of term sheet to the, to the founders, to the, the entrepreneurs. I'll shift to Portuguese. Mary is not uh, so relevant to you. Um, eu vou falar das iniciativas de Deal Flow em português porque toda a audiência é portuguesa e estas iniciativas não têm interesse para a nossa moderadora, para a Maria. Portanto, a Portugal Ventures tem permanentemente abertas as iniciativas, as calls para iniciativas para recebermos projetos, propostas de investimento. 
No próximo dia, portanto, designadamente a Col MVP tem estado praticamente aberta em permanência, com alguns interregnos. A Call for Tourism está aberta em permanência também. Tínhamos também aberta em permanência uma call para investimentos na região autónoma dos Açores, na medida em que a Portugal Ventures tem um fundo especializado e dedicado à região autónoma dos Açores. Neste momento podem fazer aplicações, podem fazer candidaturas, mas o fundo já está totalmente aplicado. Vamos tentar fazer um aumento de capital nesse fundo e vamos também, estamos a ter com algumas iniciativas para tentar levantar um fundo especializado para a região autónoma dos Açores. Vamos ver se temos a colaboração do IFB nisso. Estamos a contar com ela. <risos> Temos, vamos abrir agora três calls específicas uh, no, dia, no próximo dia 30 de maio para a chamada Call uh, Economy, uh, Blue Economy, Green Economy and Agrotech and Biotech. Estamos neste momento a fazer a divulgação. Um, Trata-se de, de, de está, está especialmente dirigida, estas três calls estão especialmente dirigidas a empresas uh, destes setores uh, que tenham já um protótipo, uh, que tenham já, uh, isto há semelhança também da cola MVP, também é um, é um pouco semelhante, eu depois não vou voltar a repetir estas coisas porque o mesmo se passa na nossa cola MVP. É importante que haja já um protótipo, é importante que haja já algum feedback do mercado relativamente ao produto ou ao serviço ou à tecnologia que esteja a ser posta no mercado e que preferencialmente tenham já captado os primeiros clientes. Um, tem que ser, o investimento é feito exclusivamente em empresas portuguesas, com sede em Portugal, com atividade relevante em Portugal, que estejam localizadas no norte, no centro ou no Alentejo. Portanto, como eu referi há pouco, não são elegíveis empresas situadas em Lisboa e Vale do Tejo, ou na Madeira ou Açores, que tenham menos de três anos desde o início da sua atividade. Portanto, estamos a falar aqui de startups, de dinheiro para empresas novas. Um, com exceção do Alentejo, é? que pode ter aqui um período de, de atividade um pouco superior, que pode ir até aos sete anos de atividade. Uh, portanto, isto são um, várias, várias vertentes, vários setores dentro da Blue Economy. Podemos estar a falar da aquacultura, de biotecnologia marinha, de energias renováveis oceânicas soluções tecnológicas para, para o mar ou o turismo náutico, entre outras, apenas exemplificativo. No caso da Green Economy, podemos estar a falar de biomassa, biomateriais, construção ou demolição, matérias-primas críticas, desperdício alimentar, plásticos, tudo o que tem a ver com a economia circular e tudo o que tem a ver com aproveitamento de materiais e contribuir para um, uma economia mais verde, mais descarbonizada. Ao nível de, de, do agrotec ou da bioeconomia, por isso aqui são setores como a agroindústria, a agricultura biológica, Floresta e gestão, proteção da floresta e gestão florestal, biotecnologia, irrigação, água, produção pecuária, produção orgânica animal, proteção de plantas, blockchain, pode ser também alimentação sustentável, entre outras. Quanto à cola MVP, não me vou repetir, são, têm as características, os, os projetos têm que ter características idênticas. O investimento que fazemos situa-se, o ticket situa-se entre os 300 mil euros e 1 milhão de euros. Depende dos projetos, depende também do estágio em que se encontra a empresa em que investimos e depende dos setores de atividade. 
portanto, tem que ter já um mínimo produto viável, não é? Em funcionamento, um primeiro contacto com o mercado, estar já numa fase de aperfeiçoamento e desenvolvimento do, do produto, eventualmente já a incorporar o feedback dos, dos primeiros clientes angariados. Portanto, nós não investimos na fase ainda da ideação, da ideia de, de ver se o produto funciona, portanto, normalmente essa fase é a fase dos, dos subsídios, uh, dos subsídios à investigação, à investigação e desenvolvimento, uh, em consórcio, individual, é a fase dos business angels, portanto, nós entramos já nesta fase em que há um mínimo produto viável, um protótipo em funcionamento, um primeiro contacto com o mercado. Pronto, as características não vou repetir, são as mesmas que eu referi para estas três novas calls. Isto são exemplos também de, de, áreas, de, de áreas de atividade enquadráveis na call MVP. Temos aqui vários setores na área do digital, vários setores na área do engineering and manufacturing, Vários setores na área de Life Sciences. Um, e agora aqui, uh, a Call for Tourism. A Call for Tourism abrange o turismo tech e não tech, com investimentos que podem ir até um milhão e meio de euros. Portanto, nós temos aqui uma, uma fasquia mais alargada para investimentos na área do turismo. Uh, os fundos da área do turismo são, um, dentro dos 18 fundos geridos pela Portugal Ventures, são os que estão, neste momento, bastante capitalizados. Portanto, nós estamos muito ativos nesta área. Um, os projetos uh, têm também que ter já algum protótipo, feedback do mercado, uh, têm que ter também já algum, uh, alguns clientes angariados. Um, tem que ser também investimentos em empresas portuguesas, sediadas em Portugal, com menos de sete anos desde o início da atividade. Também aqui temos um bocadinho mais de, de, de margem. Não é? Podemos ter empresas já com sete anos de atividade. Temos aqui alguns setores na área não-tech. Portanto, nós podemos estar a falar desde alojamento local... A Uh, parques temáticos, operadores turísticos, atividades de entretenimento, uh, turismo equestre, vínico, náutico, portanto, aquilo que dentro daquelas áreas onde Portugal tem muito para oferecer. Ok, já vou terminar. Uh, dentro do turismo tech temos também aqui alguns setores. Uh, e agora que já me deram um sinal... Vou terminar. Um, portanto, os principais desafios em termos do, do financiamento, isto é a nossa conclusão, a reflexão que fizemos, os principais desafios em termos do financiamento alternativo em Portugal. Um, os principais mecanismos e instrumentos estão disponíveis em Portugal. Nós temos todos os tipos de crowdfunding, desde o do reward, o lending, o equity... Uh, começamos a ter já também o peer-to-peer -peer lending, temos já legislação, uh, regulamentação, um, portanto, os instrumentos estão disponíveis. A necessidade por parte quer das startups, quer das pequenas e médias empresas existe, portanto, elas precisam de capital, precisam de financiamento. De facto, os financiamentos mais tradicionais, e nomeadamente os bancários, não são suficientes. Não só não, é, não são suficientes, não, não abrangem estas atividades. Não, uma empresa com menos de três anos de atividade, uma pequena e média empresa sem garantias para dar, não arranja financiamento, a menos que seja com a garantia mútua. Não é? E, portanto, estes instrumentos existem, a necessidade existe, um, uh, o que terá de haver agora é uma maior divulgação, é criar uma cultura de utilizar estes mecanismos, uma cultura de confiança, isto foi aliás referido pela Candela na, na sua apresentação inicial, é preciso criar uh, awareness, não é? é preciso criar uh, o conhecimento, a cultura, educar, criar muita confiança para que uh, 
para que as, as pessoas adiram, as empresas adiram a estes instrumentos alternativos de financiamento e criar muita confiança não só na parte das empresas, mas na parte dos investidores, de quem investe através de uma plataforma de crowdfunding. Faço o meu investimento, o meu pequeno de investimento, de mil, dois mil, cinco mil euros, eu tenho que ter alguma confiança. Essa confiança tem não só a ver com a informação existente, a ver informação suficiente e a ver também casos de sucesso que sejam divulgados. É muito importante divulgar os casos de sucesso para que esta confiança cresça e se instale verdadeiramente. Hum, achamos que é desejável haver uma maior cooperação entre os diferentes instrumentos de financiamento alternativo. Por exemplo, no caso da Portugal Ventures, nós já temos muita cooperação com outros VCs, temos muita cooperação com Business Angels e agora estamos também a fazer investimentos em, em co-investimento com, com a Seeders, que é uma plataforma de equity crowdfunding. Temos um protocolo, fazemos investimentos em conjunto. Achamos também que é muito importante que sejam criados eh, incentivos fiscais. Eh, a parte regulatória, pronto, está, o mínimo está feito, mas agora era importante haver incentivos fiscais, essencialmente para os investidores, os investidores nos, no, no financiamento alternativo. Porque todos nós sabemos que isto há pessoas que gostam de colaborar por altruísmo, porque querem ajudar, porque querem ajudar uh, empresas nascentes e novos negócios, ou porque são negócios ecológicos, ou porque se inserem nas suas áreas de interesse, sejam artísticas, culturais ou não. Mas isso não basta. Se houver um incentivo fiscal, obviamente que o investimento para financiar uh, uh, estas, este, para este financiamento alternativo passará, obviamente, a ser massivo. E nós já vimos isto no mercado de capitais, nós já vimos isto em, eh, muitas vezes, desde que haja incentivo fiscal, as coisas acabam por, por se massificar e por aparecer. Muito obrigada pela vossa atenção. Uh, qualquer dúvida, uh, tenham aqui os contactos gerais e os meus contactos. Estou ao vosso dispor para qualquer questão que queiram colocar. Muito obrigada. Há questões? Sim. Sugeriam que houvesse incentivos fiscais para os investidores. A minha, a minha questão é o seguinte. Uh, uh, Há a experiência noutros países, de, de, se, se há a experiência noutros países de incentivos fiscais que tenha resultado, quando eles existem, de forma massiva, tal como referiu. Certo. Então, se, se há boas práticas, se, se, será uma, é, obviamente que é uma coisa interessante para os investidores. Não é? e, 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 e agora, se, se funciona realmente, isso tem, tem casos... De... Funciona. Em, em financiamento alternativo, não lhe sei dizer. Em Portugal não há, e as experiências internacionais, talvez a Candela possa explicar, Candela está aqui, porque eles é que têm aqui o panorama europeu, designadamente, destes oito países que fazem parte, que fazem parte deste consórcio, não é? Hum, eu admito que sim, mas eu não tenho dados porque eu não estudei o exemplo, os, os, os casos europeus. Não sei se a Candela está, ela não está. Está a Candela, está ali. Pode explicar como é que têm funcionado os incentivos fiscais na, na Europa? Designadamente temos a questão de UK. UK é o maior... Eu vou fazer uma pergunta em inglês. Se há casos, success cases of... Uh, of uh, tax, tax incentives incentive. in the other countries yes. that, uh, uh, in order to, to, to increase their success. To follow that okay. example. Okay. Yeah, um, uh, I, I told you before, I, I wanted to ask uh, Pedro about the, the, the slide without the UK, and the reason why the UK was so uh, big in equity crowdfunding uh, was because of the tax incentives. So that, that's a very clear example um, Uh, to show you that uh, uh, that the volume grew immensely. So they, they have, uh, in the UK, they have incentives 
Yes, in for, for investors in, for investors uh, in, in, in crowdfunding. Okay, significant and relevant incentives. Okay. Significant okay. and relevant. Okay. And I, and, uh, I know, uh, I don't know the details, but I know that the Belgium uh, government uh, um, adopted those same uh, incentives. And, and also there, the volume of crowdfunding uh, grew immensely. So, the, of, yeah, if, if the incentives are uh, relevant. Are working. The incentives and then are, they working are working yes. in the UK. But it, it does also, uh, that, that was another question. It, it's, again, a general question. But and probably is for that that the UK is clearly the leader in uh, alternative finance in Europe. Yeah. Clearly the leader, uh, yes. I don't understand either why it was not in the, in the, in the map. In the graphic, yeah, it yeah. was it was to show the um, uh, th there's a big difference. A so, big difference. Uh, so yeah. Portugal will disappear. <laughs> <laughs> we are in the, la in the last position. Perhaps <laughs> will disappear if we put the, the I would sorry, the UK uh, in the sorry map. to interrupt. I would just like to add also in from other, the study in our project we have uh, found out that also. Uh, uh, quite a success case is Estonia, is what is, is, is a, a, a small country, but the, this uh, culture is, is very tech savvy culture, and they are very uh, advanced in implementing technology in many procedures, and uh, and, uh, and they, they have a regulatory framework and tax incentive very very uh, con um, consolidated in there. Yeah, thank you. Thank okay, you. thank you. I believe we. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. We we should proceed to the next speaker who will be again uh, um, connected to us uh, via Skype. This is uh, Luis Miguel um, Campo, and he uh, uh, is calling in from uh, the United States. He's the director of uh, SMEN, which is funded by um, uh, IFD. And he will uh, give a presentation. Okay. Are you there, Luis? Just a second. Oh, he will almost be there. Okay, good. Um, I, I just had one more question. Um, when I was listening to the presentation by Helena, I, uh, when I was preparing for this, uh, this day, I was looking into some, some news about uh, crowdfunding, and I found that there uh, recently has been a major crowdfunding campaign on PPL uh, for a, a strike by nurses. And I was wondering, um, if that would have caused, uh, uh, created more awareness about crowdfunding, but we can get into that later. Is Luis here? Or not here, but is his presence still not there? Okay. Uh, and then I have another question to you as the audience um, about the awareness of crowdfunding. Uh, who of you have uh, had invested in a crowdfunding um, campaign? Okay. And uh, who has uh, conducted a crowdfunding campaign or has considered doing one? Okay, great. Cool. Well, that's good. Okay. Well, that's the start. And there's no Louise still? Oh, I don't think so. Okay. Lessons learned. Yeah, maybe that's a good uh, intermezzo. Thank you for that suggestion. Yes. So, any particular question that you want to ask, like how the experience was? Okay. Is he here? We are fixing the connection. Okay, okay. great. Okay. So, uh, we, we wait a little uh, longer for Luis from the United States. And uh, I would like to proceed uh, with um, uh, Felipe Portela with his presentation and uh, um, explain what Red Angels uh, impact uh, does for SMEs in, um, in Portugal. And, and my question in 
prior to your presentation is why red? I was wondering. <laughs> It's on purpose, good. Um, so, good morning everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, congrats for our organizing this event outside of Porto and, and, and Lisbon. Always good to be in this smaller city, especially in Portugal. That's why I, I, woke, I woke up at 6.30 this, this morning just to be here in person, because I think this is, this is important. And I'm, 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 actually, I'm actually glad I went just after Elena, uh, because um, I just left Cedar uh, in the beginning of the year, and I was the responsible for the South European market. I was actually the, the one that, that kicked off the partnership with, with PV. Um, and, and with Red Angels, actually, and all of that, so, so, so it's actually a, a pleasure to be here. And um, so, um, sorry, and, uh, and instead of, of talking about uh, business angels and all of that and Red Angels, you just can go to redangels.pt and you see all the information. Business angels, you can go to the web and find all the information about that. Uh, since I'm guessing uh, pretty much everyone is from startups or from companies, I, I took a more um, startup approach and, and what you should do and should not do when you are looking for investment, or in this case, alternative fund for fundraising, especially um, if you are looking into business angel, VC, or equity crowdfunding in this case, which is my, my um, expertise. And, um, and my first re re recommendation you usually is always uh, just don't do it, okay? <laughs> Uh, this, is, this is the first thing, okay? So unless you, you actually are right in the, in, in, in the right spot, in the, in, the, in the right moment, and actually this investment can be, can, can be a good investment for you and for your company, just don't do it, okay? Just don't fall into the trap of easy money, of, of, of cheap money. Uh, either it is crowdfunding, VC, business angel, whatever, okay? Just, just don't do it. And, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I like to move a lot. <laughs> um, so, so what I'm trying to say is that, so an investment round is usually a really time consuming, um, really effort task, and, and you should consider if, if it is the right uh, process and the right time and, and path for you and for your company at, at the moment. Um, because you, you actually have, uh, and, and and actually I didn't include all of the, of the ones that are in, in, in your flyers, but you actually have all other means of getting um, investment from debt, of course, from the traditional banks, from awards, from accelerator programs, smaller money, but it's also, um, it's also a, a chance, it's also opportunity. Pre-sales or crowdfunding, like, like Pedro was talking, a crowd, um, reward crowdfunding, which basically you are doing a pre-sale, you are selling your product before you have your product, um, and of course bootstrapping, so do whatever you can with, with whatever you, you have in, in, in hand. Okay, so if, if you actually need to, to do, or if you, if, if you actually wanna do it and wanna go for, for this investment round, I usually re recommend, especially if, if you are talking about alternative um, financing, alternative investment, I usually recommend to use a, a consultant, and I'm not going to go deeper on this. And this, for me, is actually the most important slide of uh, all of them. So if, if we take time uh, on the x-axis and the revenue stage on the y-axis, usually all companies, they have an S-factor, so they start from the negative point, they have a small growth, and they have a big growth, and at a certain time, they stagnate. All companies have this, okay, sooner or later. Um, and then if we put into also the different stages of a company, pre-seed, seed, early stage, blah, 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 all of that, um, this is usually the path you have when you are getting finance or you are, when, when you're getting fundraise for your company, okay? So you usually start with the four Fs. Do, does an, anyone know what this means, the four Fs? Family, friends, 
fools and everyone everyone misses the fourth F, which is founders. Founders, they have to be the first ones, right? You are the first ones. You are the first ones to put your time, your sweat, and 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 your money. But but you are correct on the others. Uh, family, friends, and fools, of course. Usually, fools are also the first ones to to, to invest in a crowdfunding. Usually, the first one is a reward based. Again, if you have a product, all of that, you are pre-selling your, your product, so usually it, it works. Then if your company continues to raise, maybe equity crowdfunding can be a solution, why, why not? Eventually, even in together with, with a business angel. B business angel usually they, they invest from 20 to 100, 200K in, in Portugal at least. Those are usually the, the tickets they invest. If your company continues to raise, then you can go to a VC, a venture capital. Usually, and, and like Elena was saying, they start to, to invest starting from 100, 300,000 upwards to 1 million, 2 million. It, it then depends on the VC and on the sector, all of that. And then eventually, debt is always a solution, of course. And then eventually, you can do something like a private equity, an IPO, and sell. To a, to a competitor, sell to, to a partner, what, what we called an, 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 an exit. And usually this is more or less the path that, that a company uh, does. And for me, this is the main slide of them all, okay? Um, so when you are talking to the investors, the first one is always the hardest one, okay? It's always the hardest one. It's, it's always the one that is going to take the longest time uh, it's, 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 it's going to push you the, the, the hardest. But after you get this first one, usually it's also the lead investor, the one that sets the terms. After you get this one, the next ones usually are easier if you need more than one. Usually it also happens. Uh, luckily, um, in Portugal, it's not that uncommon to happen. At least in Business Angel VC world, it's not uncommon to have a co-investment. So, and that's good. And now, luckily, we are also starting to have with different partners, like Elena was saying, between a VC, which is Port Portugal Ventures, and an equity crowdfunding platform, which, which is Cedars. And this, the, and this is the first time th this is happening. So, happy times. This is, this is nice. Um, and usually, investors, so they always analyze a startup, and they always decide if they want to invest or not. But the opposite should happen also, OK? And these, these usually are, are the five things you should look at an investor um, for you to decide if you want them to invest in your company or not. And the first thing is the so-called IUM, which is Assets Under Management, okay? So how much money have they invested so far in company, okay? Uh, in which sectors do they invest? So do they invest in your sector? So like, again, like Elena was, was saying, they, they invest in specific in sectors. So if you have a company that, that is not in one, one of Portugal venture sectors, it doesn't even matter. Please don't go and talk with them. It, it's, it's pointless, okay? And like Portugal Ventures, other investors, they are just like that. Um, dry powder, this is also really important. So dry powder is basically the amount that the investor has to invest, okay? Uh, so the amount they have in their pocket to actually to invest. And usually investors, they never want to say this, okay? Usually investors, they always put you in the trap. They always, they, they, they always take you in the talk, you know, until they are gathering funds uh, to actually invest. But this is one of, of the first questions you have to, to do, is how much do they actually have to, to invest in your company, okay? Um, the number of deals they have done, this is also important because it tells you their, their experience, especially in your sector, okay? And uh, usually the ticket size, again. So if you are looking for half a million, for instance, it probably doesn't make sense for you to go and talk to a business angel. Uh, and the opposite is also true. If you are just looking for 50K, for instance, it doesn't, it, it's, um, it, it doesn't make sense for you to go and talk with a VC. 50K is more of a business angel ticket, okay? Um, this is also important. So usually, so I'll start with this. Usually, um, <coughs> this is the three things that an investor uses to decide if they invest in a company or not, okay? The risk, 
of the investment, the market they are in, if it is a good market, bad market, if the market is growing, if it is dying, whatever, and the team, okay? If the team is good, if the team is complementary, all, all of that, okay? This is what they use to decide, but this is what they actually invest in, okay? So they invest in assets, they invest in tech, they invest in intellectual property, they invest in, in future cash flow eventually, okay? So they don't invest in team. They don't like to invest in, in HR, okay? So don't ask money to invest in, in, in human resources. So if you want to invest in human resources, ask money to invest in tech or in IP, okay? So tell the investor that you are going to transform that human resources into, into, into an asset, okay? That's, that's how you have to sell stuff. So you have to tell the investor that you're going to transform his investment into future cash flow. Okay, that's how you have to do your, your sell, your pitch, so to say. Um, and I'm, I don't know how much time I have, but uh, just to wrap up, investment is like a marriage, so please be careful with the investor you choose, okay? Take them out to dinner, go and grab a, a, a glass of wine with them, talk, talk with them, just don't talk shop, talk about the other stuff, because in the end, um, I can see, sorry. Uh, I have really bad vision. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so, 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 so it's really important. So usually an, an investor is much more than money. So it's really important that an investor is there when you need them and that they help you open doors, okay? So please be, be aware of that. Um, and there are different kinds of, of, of investments. So it can be grants, debt, equity, uh, mezzanine, quasi-equity, all of that. So I'm not going too deep, to go deep on that. Um, this is also important. So usually when you do an investment, you should also consider, you'll always consider CapEx and OpEx. So basically this is the, the, the initial investment plus the operational investment. And usually you should consider this for about 18 to 36 months, okay? This is usually the average time. So how much money do you need to kick off this next stage or to kick off the business or whatever it is? And again, for 18 to, 30, to 36 months, and it then depends on your sector, on your company, and on, on, on all of that, okay? So this is usually the metrics. I, I can share this later on. This is, these are usually the metrics they look at, the investors look at, okay? Um, yeah, business plan or whatever. How to value the company is always a, a hassle. It's, it's, it's always a problem. We, we could be here talking all morning about this, about talking about the 50 different models and we will get to 50 different conclusions, okay? But usually the, the value of your company is the value that your first investor gives to your company, okay? That's the simplest way. So if the first investor says that your company is, is valued at one million, that's usually how much it will be valued, okay? You cannot agree and then you can go and talk to another investor and, that, and those second investor gives you 1.5, okay? And then, then that's your first investor, of course, okay? But usually, so the, the first investor that's willing to put money in your company at a given valuation, that's, that's how much your company is worth, okay? Uh, again, uh, valuation models, all of that, this is beautiful, we can, we can change this, and, and this, you, you will also have access to this, okay? This is my contacts, please uh, bother me, no problem, send me a text or an email, whatever you need, okay? Good luck, thank you. To, uh, we can just do one question, I think. One question? Okay, it was very clear. Very, I only, I, the only thing you didn't explain was the red, but we'll do that uh, during the coffee break. Uh, let's proceed to the next speaker. Um, where is Candela? Is, um, is there a, a connection now with Luis Campos? I need some help here. It's almost there. Okay, great. And then we have um, two more speakers, and then it's time for a coffee break.
benefits are, are amazing and they are working really well and basically the investor has the chance uh, to decide if they want to pay taxes or invest in, in a startup that's pretty much it and and and, and it's and it's um, from 10 pounds so if, even if they invest 10 pounds or 100 pounds whatever it is if they invest into a startup that's how much they will deduct from their tax Basically, so the minimum they will write off is write off is around 30 percent, okay? Um, and if they have profits, they they don't pay pretty much anything on that. And if they have losses, they can uh, pretty much the write off up to 70 percent, if I'm not mistaken. It's something around these lines. If the numbers are not totally correct, it's something around these lines. And then they also they pretty much have two types of fiscal b benefits, which they call. EIS and SEIS, which is basically for uh, startups, so for companies that are just starting. And for, for those, there is a limit of 150,000 pounds per year uh, on the first three years of in investment. And then th they have, then this is the SEIS, and then they have the EIS, which the, the limit, if I'm not mistaken, is 1.5 million or 2 million, something like that. So it's, it's huge, again, per year. And, and, and again, it's, and all the, the fiscal benefit is for the investors. So, and this is, then this is being a big boost, uh, definitely for equity mm -hmm. crowdfunding in the UK. Because yeah. again, the, the investor decides, okay, do I, do I want to pay taxes or mm -hmm. do I want to invest in a startup, have profits on that? Which is, in my belief, which is a smart move from the government because if the companies are successful, they will pay more taxes than what that poor guy was going to pay in the beginning. So it's, an, it's, it's a long-term investment. That, that, that thing is not, it's not uh, uh, followed by, by other countries, and, uh, for example, in Portugal. It's, it's an it amazing question. It was followed in, in Belgium, and I need to interrupt you. We, we can discuss this later. Thank you so much for this detailed uh, explanation. Uh, we have now a connection with Luis. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I'm very happy I can hear you. Good Finally, morning. I can hear you too now. <laughs> can yes. you see my screen? I, yes, I can see your screen as well. So everything is good. Um, well, good luck with your presentation. And uh, we'll be back uh, for the questions later. I hope I can hear the questions as well. Uh, okay, thank you for having me, and um, uh, I, I thank you very much for accepting this presentation, even though I'm far away. I'm in San Francisco right now, but I hope that the connection is good enough that uh, I can make myself understood. It is. You can, you can proceed. So let's... Let's start with a very small, uh, short description of who we are. Uh, we are a um, business angel fund, and uh, we have under management 2.7 million euros, uh, which is uh, divided between the public investment uh, by IFT, which I think it's represented in the panel, and private money. Uh, we have a period of investment and the investment of seven years. The fund started officially in 2017 and we will be running until 2023. We have currently uh, five companies in our portfolio and there's three companies that are just waiting for the final approval of the investors of the fund uh, to be submitted for approval by the IFD. So IFD is a co-investor in our funds. We have a current um, number of investors, um, 14, and this uh, number does not include, obviously, IFD. And uh, uh, as I will show in a, slide, um, in a few slides, uh, the number of investors is um, supposed to grow 
very very much within the next uh, six to seven months. And we have received over the last uh, two years about a little bit over 500 pitches. And you can see that there is a big, um, a small, a small percentage of uh, pitches that we have received that actually turned into investments on our part. There's many reasons for that. Uh, the first reason, obviously, is some of them are of um, very low quality. But uh, there are other reasons besides that. Uh, one of uh, our main strategies is to involve at least one of the investors uh, in a day-to-day -day operation of the companies we invest in. And if there is no investor willing to do that, even though the idea might actually sound good, we decide not to invest. Another reason is the valuation that currently some um, entrepreneurs attribute to their own uh, ideas. And uh, when I mean ideas, we, we are investing in a uh, very early stage. So we are investing in ideas or in prototypes. So we don't require the company to have already traction to customers, etc. And even at these very low, um, at very early stages, some entrepreneurs have uh, attributes a valuation that is, in our opinion, completely uh, off the market. And therefore, we let those, um, those speeches also go away. So the fact that we have only 1% uh, of investment uh, it is, is a consequence of this strategy. Oh, I, I, I hear a lot of noise, uh, background noise, uh, sorry. Uh, we invest primarily in unproven companies, so we are clearly seed capital. We invest also in founders that can, with our help, in less than one year, implement their vision and go from an idea to a fully functional prototype. So we don't require them to have a prototype to start with, but we require them to give us a clear uh, set of milestones at which, in we, uh, which points they will accept, they will uh, uh, achieve the results that they propose. And we evaluate those milestones. So typically we ask milestones every three months. Um, and if they don't uh, reach the milestones, then we need to have a mitigation strategy to make sure that the next milestone can be achieved. We also try, try to understand with the founders uh, what is going wrong. So maybe we can help them more. Maybe their strategy is not the correct one. Maybe they need to uh, hire, more, hire more staff uh, to to make the to make the development faster. So there's many things that can happen in the five companies that we have invested so far. Since we have invested um, at different times, some of those companies already have a prototype and they're already acting in the market and they're growing. Some of the other companies that we've invested more recently have not um, been around enough to miss any of the milestones. Uh, we always target, and this is a very differentiating factor, we always target to have 51% uh, equity of the companies, but we always give a buyback option to the founders. So we, we hope that the founders, um, after one year, are able to recover the majority of the company uh, if they, if they uh, reach some criteria, but the idea of getting 51% is to avoid some of the, the pitfalls that are very common in startups. When the entrepreneurs, the founders, are very good at what they know, but probably not as good at managing a company. Maybe some of them, most of them, have never managed any company, and we are there to help. But in order to help them, we need to have the control of the company, because we've already had lots of years of experience managing companies, and we know the mistakes that often um, we've made ourselves, the investors, when starting a startup ourselves. And uh, we invest up to 200,000 euros in each of the companies. And this uh, amount of money is uh, a part private money, part uh, from IFD. So there's rules, clear rules from the IFD that prevents larger investments. And uh, we don't want to invest uh, very small amounts of money in which that provide no contribution to the company. And so we set the minimum at 50,000 euros. Of course, there are exceptions, or there might be exceptions in the future, but these are the guidelines. Why are we different than the, the majority of the business angel funds? First, because we don't provide funding only. In fact, the main difference between um, our business angel fund and other 
funds that uh, I'm aware of, not in Portugal in particular, but around the world, is that we actually are directly involved in all the strategic and operational developments of the companies we invest in. So we have decided that we only invest in a company if at least one investor is involved as a mentor. And each investor must be a mentor in at least two companies. So that doesn't mean that one company will have only one investor as a mentor. We can have four investors that are really interested in a specific idea uh, to be mentors of that idea, so they can provide their uh, their insights, their experience. But at least two companies must be mentored by one investor alone. So we only accept investors that are willing to accept this condition. So they don't only bring money, they actually have to bring more than money. So they have to bring their time and they have to bring their experience in, onto the table to help the entrepreneurs. We are a fund, we're not a club, which means that uh, all the money has been allocated into this fund, uh, uh, Sociedade Anonima in Portuguese, and we have our vehicle, and we have committed ourselves that all decisions taken by the majority have to be accepted by all investors, meaning that we do not choose and pick which companies Individually, we don't choose and pick which companies we want to invest in as investors. And finally, uh, our reach is global. So the number of investors today is only 14, and only one investor is uh, located outside Portugal in Brazil. But since the beginning, our strategy was to have a very large number of investors from different geographies and also from different backgrounds, so that we can actually analyze a specific idea and provide the networking necessary for that idea to reach the market. So we are currently, I am currently here in San Francisco having discussions with uh, very many small investors that uh, I'm trying to convince to invest in Portugal through our fund. And most likely it, I will succeed because the, the, the conditions that IFD provides are fantastic for any investor. And the tax conditions are also very good. Uh, we, we must, uh, we must uh, acknowledge that, even though they are mostly uh, for Portuguese citizens. Um, so we are probably going to bring around 15 to 20 new investors within the next seven months from geographies such as USA, Brazil, and Switzerland. We only invest in companies, as I said earlier, in which at least one of the fund investors can, without a doubt, provide significant contributions to its success. So we don't invest in a company that has a very good idea, even if we believe in the entrepreneur, but none of the investors can actually provide any value to the company. So if we can open doors, if we can use the companies that we own ourselves to, um, to develop a prototype or to implement a prototype, then we will be interested in investing in the company. Otherwise, we'll just pass the idea to another uh, BA or a VC that probably will be interested in that idea. Our ex exit strategy is to sell partially our holdings at a five-time valuation from the, from the initial investment. And we keep the remaining ownership and we go along for the ride. So we might have in our portfolio a unicorn we want to make sure that at the right time we sell with this valuation that we had internally set as a goal, but we don't sell all the percentage. We keep some of the percentage and we obviously do not follow up in um, uh, future investment rounds, but we would keep dil diluting our percentage, but we will still have um, a lottery ticket, let's say, if one of the uh, companies we invested in becomes a unicorn. Uh, we provide day-to-day -day support to the management of the companies, and this is one of the reasons why we expect to reduce the number of uh, bad investments. So I put bad here, there's no bad investments, but investments that fail uh, to close to 10%. So we expect to have a very low failure rate. Uh, we think that our experience and the time that we're going to dedicate to each of these companies we invest in is going to be the reason why these companies will succeed. Not all of them will provide this five-time valuation that we expect, we know that, but we hope that at least only, uh, or at most only 10% of the companies you invest in will actually fail. And uh, our extensive network among top Portuguese universities 
um, I've been, um, I'm a PhD uh, from the United States and I know lots of colleagues that receive PhDs and return to Portugal and our professors at some of the top universities in, uh, in Portugal. This fact allows us to access great ideas at a very early stage. And not only that, uh, we get them at a very low valuation because the entrepreneurs that have a long-term vision, they actually prefer support from the investors, support rather than money. And this support can be in, the, in terms of uh, knowledge in the area, it could be networking, it could be the ability to recruit the right talent for the team. So it's not just money that we bring, and this allows us to actually invest at very low valuations, which makes it more likely that we can exit at a five-time valuation. Currently in our portfolio, we have uh, five companies, as I mentioned. We have Climber, which is a revenue management solution that helps independent hotels maximize their profits through the automation of their pricing systems. We have a very well-established company called Go Wi-Fi that does geo marketing, that has a geo marketing platform that allows brands and retailers to reach target audience. We have two new um, additions to our portfolio, Berg Anchor, which uh, the brand name is Yacht Wizards, which is in short uh, Airbnb for yachts, for boats, for uh, renting um, privately owned boats, and Stability Bubble, which is a platform that replicates in digital form all stages of the criminal or civil process, allowing the organization analysis and presentation of facts, participants in evidence, and to their credit, uh, they are currently being used by the Portuguese Ministry of Justice in several high visibility cases. For those of you that are Portuguese, you probably know which cases I'm talking about. And finally, we have what I would say uh, our star of the moment, which is Koala Tech, which is a very technical um, um, company. It's a company that is uh, basically in the area of um, uh, re uh, maximizing energy efficiency in many uh, areas using many devices. So I'm not going to bother you with the details, but the next slide is important. Um, this is a company that is very uh, unique. It's backed by seven patents, four already approved, both in the United States and European Union. And this, was, this is a company started by three professors uh, at the University of Lisbon. And uh, they already had one patent when uh, we looked at them the first time. And in fact, this is one of the reasons uh, why I mentioned in a pre uh, prior slide why we could get into a very low valuation. First reason, I knew the three of them very well. They were my former colleagues at university. Secondly, they realized that I could probably bring some insights and develop new patents based on uh, the current patent that they had. So they presented the patent to me, I gave them some ideas, and after that, we've already uh, submitted three new patents that are pending approval. So this company has patents that demonstrate theoretically that we can have 80% energy efficiency in power amplification. So not all power consumption, just the power amplification, which in a base station accounts for about 22% of the energy consumption. And it's a gigantic market both in terms of technologies and devices and the volume. So we have uh, estimated based on uh, research that is available, uh, freely available on the web, that <clears throat> if all the base stations, and we're just talking about base stations here, so we're not talking about smartphones, Wi-Fi access points, and so on and so forth. If all the base stations in the world, 5G, 4G, 3G, use our technology, there will be a potential in savings of 10 billion euros a year. So the question now is whether or not the theoretical framework that has been developed and patent can actually be implemented. So we are doing that now, and that's how that's why they needed our investment was to basically fund the recruitment of several engineers, um, some of them PhDs, uh, engineers with PhDs. So they have worked with the three professors, and that they were be they were available to work in this particular uh, project rather than accept jobs at Xilinx or Broadcom or Qualcomm. So we were able to secure three extremely bright um, PhDs that are now implementing what has been um, uh, studied and proved theoretically. 
And now, I don't know if I'm going to be able to hear any questions, but I will try. So I have um, time for answering any questions you might have in the public, in the audience. Thank you so much, Luis. That was very clear. Are there questions? And right after this, we will uh, have a coffee break. So uh, um, that's good to know. But first, some questions. No, I believe it was all very clear. Thank you so much. And um, uh, I hope uh, we can share your slides as well with, uh, with the audience so, um, so they can look at it again. Thanks so much. Yes. And uh, what time is it now where you are? Sorry? I ask what the time is. Oh, the time here is 3.43 in the morning. OK. <laughs> well, thank you so much for, for waking up and giving this presentation. And I hope you get some more sleep now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> OK. Well, we have a coffee break now. I think uh, we, we've all deserved that. And uh, then we continue with the last two speakers of the first panel. And um, well, we'll be back soon. There's coffee uh, out here. Thank you. Uh, in order to make it in time for the round table and the lunch. So I'm asking the um, panelists to, to make their presentation a little shorter and um, you will help them tell them when uh, the time is, uh, is nearly there. Uh, so let's um, uh, continue. And I would like to uh, introduce you to, I hope I pronounce it correctly, <laughs> and I need to speak and now I make myself nervous, Ozoria. Miranda from Yap May. Is that correct? Okay, she will um, uh, tell more about what Yap May does for SMEs. Thank you so much. Just press the button. Yes, thanks. No, I asked that. Yeah, do Yap May. Olá a todos. Eu, contrariamente aos oradores antecedentes, eu vou falar em português. Foi assim que, que me transmitiram que, de, que deveria fazer, de maneira que eh, começo por agradecer o convite que foi dirigido ao IAPMEI para participarmos nesta iniciativa. É com todo o gosto que aqui estamos. Eh, cumprimento todos os oradores, todos os membros de todos os painéis, bem como todos os presentes. Uh, o desafio que nos foi colocado foi para falar um pouco então dos instrumentos financeiros que estão disponíveis e da forma como isso pode ajudar a alavancar, a fazer crescer, a reforçar a competitividade das empresas. Antes disso, uh, eu gostaria só de deixar-vos umas breves notas sobre o que é o IAPMEI. O IAPMEI é, naturalmente, que aqui em Portugal a maior parte conhece, de qualquer modo, neste contexto, eh, gostaria de dizer que é um instituto público, é um instituto público que tem a autonomia financeira e administrativa, tem um património próprio e que visa, essencialmente, apoiar as empresas, apoiar as empresas nas suas lógicas de crescimento, em situação, na inovação, na internacionalização e, portanto, de um modo geral, procurando acompanhar as empresas desde a sua fase de nascimento ao crescimento, à revitalização, em todos os contextos. Alguns números só para contextualizar, Portanto, temos, fizemos 44 anos, temos uma estrutura que é maioritariamente com quadros técnicos licenciados, temos 12 delegações regionais no país, de modo a procurarmos estar mais perto das empresas, o objetivo e o foco é exatamente a proximidade regional e daí as tais 12 delegações. Um, temos algumas áreas uh, em que estamos 
particular, a que damos particular enfoque, desde logo a proximidade regional e o licenciamento, mas também o investimento, a inovação, o empreendedorismo e a capacitação. Estas são efetivamente as nossas principais áreas. Uh, e temos um conjunto amplo de produtos e serviços, inclusivamente no nosso site temos um catálogo de produtos e serviços que podem visitar e onde estão lá especificados todos os produtos que desenvolvemos nas diversas áreas funcionais. Entrando propriamente eh, neste tema, neste tema eh, e de modo a que efetivamente sejam desenvolvidos e promovidos produtos mais adequados à situação das empresas, nesta matéria começou por ser efetuado um diagnóstico, um diagnóstico ao nível dos financiadores, e o que é que evidenciou que efetivamente existem dificuldades ao nível dos financiadores de captação da poupança. As, os bancos têm, têm também uma grande pressão ao nível do capital regulamentário, há insuficiente oferta de crédito e há uma grande aversão de, de risco, ao risco de PMEs por parte dos financiadores. Este é o contexto efetivamente existente ao nível dos financiadores. Já no que respeita às empresas, é generalizada a situação de que existe escassez de capitalização, as empresas por norma ou muitas têm uma estrutura de capital deficitária, têm também dificuldade de comunicação com o mercado financeiro. É importante referir que também existe ainda muito déficit ao nível da gestão. Por outro lado, o tecido empresarial é muito fragmentado uh, e existe ainda um reduzido acesso aos investidores. Este é efetivamente o contexto e o diagnóstico no que respeita às empresas e daí que uh, os produtos desenhados tenham naturalmente em consideração estas circunstâncias e procurem uh, atenuá-las e tornar-se mais uh, adequados. Por outro lado, sabemos que existe eh, muita dificuldade em captar a poupança e, e aplicá-la nas empresas e, por isso mesmo, foram, tem, as políticas públicas têm procurado atenuar esta situação. Por um lado, no que respeita à dificuldade de obtenção de crédito através de mecanismos como sejam a garantia mútua, e também ao nível do processo do reforço de capital das empresas, através do capital de risco, através de, dos business angels e outros instrumentos. Relativamente às soluções de financiamento, portanto, estas soluções podem revestir-se sob a forma de incentivos, incentivos financeiros e incentivos fiscais, mas podem ser, ser também soluções ao nível do capital. Já uh, uh, ouvimos os oradores uh, que me antecederam uh, e, e com enfoque no, nos business angels, no capital de risco e no crowdfunding. Uma outra vertente também para os instrumentos de, de crédito e, e complementando esta parte do crédito, também as garantias. É uma nota também para dizer que uh, tem sido preocupação também das políticas públicas promover produtos que, estejam, que sejam... Como? Ah, que sejam adequados... Uh, que sejam adequados às diferentes fases da vida das empresas, desde logo para promover o empreendedorismo, mas também para fortalecer as empresas numa fase de crescimento e, muitas vezes, também em situações de revitalização. A estratégia que, que tem, tem subsistido também à promoção destes instrumentos visa, essencialmente, o reforço do capital, 
face ao diagnóstico que foi apresentado. Esse reforço de capital muitas vezes acontece sem alteração da estrutura financeira, mas pode acontecer também com a abertura de capital a novos investidores. E daí os instrumentos também de que já falámos. Uma outra preocupação, ainda no âmbito do reforço do capital, tem a ver com a promoção de eh, incentivos fiscais associados efetivamente a esse reforço de capital. Merecendo aqui destaque o, o alargamento da remuneração convencional do capital social e o que é que isso permite? Permite, na prática, deduzir ao, ao lucro tributável e ao longo de seis anos, o valor de 7% do aumento de capital efetuado. Ou seja, uma empresa que faça um aumento de capital de 100 mil euros, na prática, pode, nos seis anos imediatos, acabar por deduzir ao lucro tributável 42 mil euros, o que efetivamente já é um incentivo interessante. Mas existe uma outra via também, que é através da, da, da dedução dos lucros dos lucros retidos e reinvestidos, o DLRR. Aqui é exatamente outro mecanismo que foi desenvolvido no sentido de, e na prática traduz-se efetivamente um benefício para as empresas, tendo sido recentemente melhoradas as condições que passaram de... 25, passaram para 25%, a taxa de 25%, e, com 5, e de 50% no caso das micro e pequenas empresas, tendo também sido alargado o prazo. Efetivamente, estas são, são medidas que as políticas públicas têm procurado eh, dinamizar nesta situação. Também no acesso ao crédito têm sido, têm sido um, divulgadas e promovidas um conjunto de linhas, um conjunto de linhas com garantia mútua, de modo a partilhar o risco e, de, e, e, de, e desse modo as empresas poderem ter mais facilmente o acesso ao financiamento. Trata-se de, de linhas de crédito bonificadas com, garantia de, com garantias Uh, através da, da garantia mútua, uh, das quais eu destacaria, então, a linha Capitalizar. A linha Capitalizar 2018 tem um montante de 1 milhão e 600 mil euros. Existem depois várias vertentes desta linha, uh, destinada e mais focada para micro e pequenas empresas, para a indústria 4.0 e para a digitalização, linhas de apoio ao fundo de maneio, ao, ao plafond de tesouraria, ao investimento, estas linhas foram disponibilizadas exatamente para facilitar, uma vez que um dos problemas que as empresas tinham mais dificuldade era aderir, era aderir, era conseguir financiamentos a médio e longo prazo, porque na maioria dos casos apenas o conseguiam em termos de curto prazo. Também uma outra forma de financiamento são os incentivos, os incentivos que disponíveis neste momento no âmbito do Portugal 2020 estão relacionadas com as três principais tipologias. Incentivos à inovação das empresas, incentivos também à, à qualificação e à internacionalização, bem como à investigação e desenvolvimento. Ainda uma nota para um sistema de incentivos que é mais ágil, os vales, que contemplam várias vertentes, a indústria 4.0, a economia circular, o Vale Inovação, o Vale Incubação, e que, de uma forma mais ágil, permitem que as empresas, muitas vezes, recorram a serviços, serviços que permitam fazer um diagnóstico à empresa e às necessidades que tem que fazer. Uma nota também para o Programa Europeu, para o Horizonte 2020 e para o COSME. Para terminar, gostaria só de, de deixar aqui uh, alguma ênfase quais são os principais objetivos que têm estado subjacentes às políticas públicas no âmbito dos instrumentos financeiros. Desde logo o reforço da capitalização, mas também a diversificação das fontes de financiamento, melhorar as condições de crédito, uh, 
a abertura de capital a novos investidores, portanto, entre outros, de modo a que, efetivamente, todas as empresas, ou uma boa parte das empresas, consigam ter acesso a estes meios que lhe permitam investir, reforçar os investimentos, diversificar os investimentos e, deste modo, tornarem-se mais competitivas. Muito obrigada. Era isto que eu tinha com este tempo. Muito obrigada. I didn't understand a thing, but I wonder if, uh, if you have a question. We only have room for one question, actually. Yes, please. Rosaria? 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 A question. Olá, bom dia. Uma pergunta muito simples e prática. Uh, a entrada no capital de, de investidores de capital de risco, por exemplo, Pode alterar o estatuto PME da empresa ou existe alguma legislação específica que, para este tipo de investimento, impede essa alteração? Pode repetir, por favor, que eu não ouvi mesmo o início da questão. A entrada no capital de, de empresas de capital de risco, por exemplo, pode alterar o estatuto PME ou existe alguma legislação específica que faça com que não exista essa alteração em função do tipo de capital? Pode alterar, isto é, a empresa tem a sua natureza jurídica, não é? E com a entrada uh, de uma empresa de capital de risco, à partida, a estrutura jurídica da empresa... Eu não sei se percebi bem a questão. Eu, sendo, sendo, sendo direto, uma empresas... microempresa, de repente, pode-se transformar numa não-PME? Numa não-PME? Sim. Uh... Por força da entrada de sociedades de capital de risco? Uh, depende. Ou... Alternativa, existe alguma legislação específica que preveja estas situações, fazendo com que o Estatuto PME não se altere? Pode haver muitas situações em que se mantém, não é? Depende efetivamente da dimensão da empresa, depende já... Se, é, não sei se concretamente está a falar numa PME, não é? é isto. é por força da entrada da empresa de capital de risco, efetivamente pode haver alteração, principalmente por, só por causa das participações, ou eu, não por causa dos outros. Por causa dos outros parâmetros. Se bem que, normalmente, as capitais de risco participam sempre com uma percentagem minoritária, não é? Minoritária. O que visam é, é além de trazer o capital, é aportarem também alguma acompanhamento na gestão uh, e, portanto, à partida, isso pode não acontecer, mas, mas pode acontecer. De qualquer modo, é celebrado sempre nessas circunstâncias um acordo para social e as situações nessa altura são devidamente analisadas. Não sei se quer acrescentar mais alguma coisa, uma vez que isso é mais até depois na prática. Já. Sim. Uh, may I yeah, add something? Uh, só para acrescentar que da experiência que temos tido com os capitais de risco, há situações de facto em que uma PME passa a não PME, sempre que a capital de risco consolide a entidade participada e sempre que a consolidação faça com que os critérios do capital de risco em termos consolidados deixem de se verificar, nomeadamente o número de trabalhadores, faturação e dimensão do ativo. Portanto, é um problema de, de dimensão da participação e de controle das participadas em que o capital de risco investe. Muito so much. And uh, I would like to invite um, Enrique Cruz from IFD to give your presentation so that we uh, can all be in time for the round table. I really look forward to having all of you sitting there and uh, interact with each other. Um, Good luck. Thank you, Marie. Is, it, is that the right pr pronouncement? I, th I, I, I listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I will start in, it. I'll try my I best. Get. I'll try my best in English. Presentation is in Portuguese. Yeah, so we can do both. No, okay. you can do, please. Good Portuguese. morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here on behalf of IFD. Uh, thank you to Altfinator for this initiative. It's uh, really important that uh, this type of um, events happens more and more here in Portugal because this, uh, we feel the need that in Portugal we may develop 
an alternative uh, financing um, system to the traditional banking system. As we know, the Portuguese banking system has suffered a lot in the recent years, and um, we know that when um, troubles happen, the banking system needs to be more careful, so we really need to develop an alternative channel to channel funds from investors to uh, companies. And at the same time, on top of that, there is the so-called market failures. Um, in the presentation, in the initial presentation, you illustrated the, um, the market gap between investors and, uh, and, uh, and companies. And really, IFD is focused on filling those gaps. That's our mission. So if I may start, I have 45 slides. <laughs> but I promise I won't take more than 10 minutes. Um, so, IFD is a, a fully state-owned company and uh, it is really focused on facilitating the access to finance to SMEs. So the idea, and particularly the long-term financing to SMEs. So the idea is really to contribute for companies to stabilize their uh, funding structure, their balance sheet in terms of financing. So we are looking after solutions to uh, contribute to, do, to, this, to this goal. Um, I already said this, we have uh, 100 million equity in our balance sheet that we are leveraging, as I will show in the next slides. For the time being, we have uh, 534 million assets under management because we developed two types of uh, activities. The first one is fund management, we manage an equity fund and a, a debt fund. Those add up to 535 million. And we also have uh, so far achieved to channel 624 million to companies. So IFD is quite a young institution. We were set up in 2014. But so far, we already achieved this amount of money to be channeled to SMEs in Portugal. Um, despite of that, we have uh, more capacity to deploy money and investment in the Portuguese economy. By joining all these types of financial instruments, we have a capacity to deploy more th than 2.7 billion euros in favor of Portuguese SMEs and also to mid-caps. Mid-caps are those companies that have up to 3,000 um, workers. So we combine all these sources. In the inner circle, you can see the resources we have. And in the outer circle, you can see the potential that we achieved to have by crowding in private investors. So the, the example that we have seen from the, the person that spoke at 3.30 3 in the morning, he, he mentioned that he has money from IFD, but he has to top up our money with private money. So at the end of the day, we double, sometimes we triple, the amount of money that we put on the table by crowding in uh, private money from other investors. So we have Capital is Armais, which is a Garantia Mutua uh, credit line, already explained here. We have Capital is Armid Caps, which is really a credit line, just funding, uh, channeled through uh, Portuguese banks in favor of companies, particularly focused on long-term financing, so this line finances up to 12 years, bullet or amortizing. So it's really focused on long-term credit for companies. We are ready to launch a restart and modernize program, which is dedicated to companies that uh, successfully restructured their debts. They renegotiate their debts with the banks, and then we need new money for those companies to restart their activity. So we are ready to launch uh, a program to help these companies to restart their, their businesses. And I think for what is important for today, we should talk about VC, Capital de Risco, 200M, and uh, also Portugal Tech and uh, Business Angels. Those are the instruments that we have for equity investments. 
I will skip the, those ones. It's more about our strategy. It's not important for today. Just to illustrate the network of partners that we already have. So we partner with 14 banks on commercializing our credit and guarantee lines. We have selected 15 VC managers, 59 business angels partners, and we also partner with the European Investment Fund, and we attract money from the European Investment Fund to match our own funds and also with the National Mutual Guarantee System for the guarantee line. So we really, it is a very dense uh, network of partners that we attracted to um, channel money to companies. Internationally, we try to uh, look after money, funding, from uh, a really large set of institutions, which are called multilateral institutions. So we try to uh, cooperate with other promotional banks. We are a promotional bank as well. So we try to partner with them in order to learn from them other successful stories about channeling money to companies, but also in some cases to um, access funding from EIB, the European Investment Bank, from CEB, the um, Development Bank of the Council of Europe, from EIF, from ECO in Spain, and from others. So we have the capacity to uh, access very cheap money from these institutions because they are AAA rated and also long-term financing because these institutions provide long-term financing. And this is the, the core slide for today. This is how we operate. So we operate exclusively as a wholesale institution. Okay? So this illustrates how we operate. We are in the left of the middle. IFD logo represents our balance sheet. And the logos below it represent the two funds that we have under management, where those 535 million are. So we partner with all these institutions on the left, including YAPMAI, that uh, made the presentation before. And these institutions on the left, they mandated IFD to manage money in favor of the companies. So we have money from the operational programs of the Portugal 2020 that instead of being provided through grants, as it was the case in former um, periods, this money now is channeled through financial instruments, through financial solutions to companies meaning that this money is leveraged because it attracts private money, okay? And also funding, as I mentioned, from EIB and from CEB. Then on the, the right-hand side, in the center, you have the partners. IFT selects partners to attract private money, but also to operate the financial instruments that we design. So IFD is looking after what we call the market failures, those situations where companies do not access funding in uh, uh, fair terms. And to provide those uh, instruments to companies, we don't do it directly to, to companies. We select, um, we select business angels, we select VC managers, Portugal Ventures is one of them, we select banks and we partner with the National Mutual Warranty System, which are the retailers of our model. Okay, so we ask them to, um, to uh, collect money from private sector and then we add up to that money, this money that is uh, entrusted to our management by these left-hand institutions. And of course, the money is intended to be deployed in the economy through uh, this process. So, all in all, what we do is we look at the right-hand side and look for market failures on access to finance from companies. We select the retailers and we negotiate funding from these left-hand uh, institutions. We are focused on long-term uh, access to finance. So, we have a credit line which goes up to 15 years with up to four years of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, um, what do you say, um, you, you don't pay 
you don't pay the principal in the, in the first uh, four years, grace period. Uh, we have guarantees through the mutual guarantee system that uh, gives up to 80% guarantee of a loan to a company. And uh, again, it's financing up to 12 years. And we have equity instruments. Um, about this uh, solution of equity instruments, I will only use my remaining time to illustrate uh, a type of transaction that we can do with business angels, for example. Depending on the location of the company, there are different proportions of uh, uh, possibility to use uh, uh, our money, money from IFD. So if you have an investment in uh, Lisbon, the, the retailer knows that he can use uh, up to 40% of the investment with our money, and he needs to raise the additional 60%. But if the company is located in Madeira or Azores, he can use up to 80% from our funds, and he only needs to raise up 15% from private uh, investors. And let me just highlight Madeira and Azores, because we are now in a, in a, in a process of selecting six business angels to operate Madeira and Azores, and the deadline is the next three of June. So if you are a business angel, you should apply to our line because you will be able to have 85% free money for your investments. This is the type of transaction a business angel usually does. We have a company that uh, intends to have two rounds of investment. In the first round, you wants to, you know, launch a product, test a product. And on the second round, he wants to develop the geography to deploy the product. So what he did, he did the company presented the idea to two business angels, EVBA1 and EVBA2. Those are two business angels companies. And the, 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 the founder of the company convinced these two business angels to invest. So EVBA1 used 44K from his own money, and he used 81K from IFD's money. So it, he added up to 135K, and the second business angel did the same. He used 55K from his own money, and he used 82K from IFD's money. And he also... Um, the, the, the funders also joined the, 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 the transaction with their own money with 10K. So they jointly, by only using 44, 55, and 10, so about 110K, they were, they were able to, um, to, to deploy 273K in the company. On the second round, the funders only convinced the second business angel but again, EVBA2 used only 55K from his own money, and he used 82K from IFD's money. So by the end of the day, what IFD is doing is facilitating the investment in uh, startups, early stage companies, up to Series A and Series B. And if I don't have any more time, I will stop here. But if I am able just to illustrate one last slide, is about the network of business angels that we have already um, partnered with. So some of them, they don't have logos because they are really starting up. And I would like to underline this aspect of our mission, that is, we not only provide money, but we also try to develop the ecosystem of business angels and the ecosystem of VC managers as well. So you can see that some of them don't have any logo because they are really starting their activities as business angels. We have a network of 59 business angels partnering with us. And we also have a network of VCs partnering with IFD. And I really um, would um, suggest you look at our website, ifd.pt, 
looking for all these partners. We have their, their address, their telephone numbers, because they really have available money now to invest in projects. So you should try to look at them and knock their door because they are really liquid for the time being. Thank you. I'm available for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Does anybody have a question? Just one again. In fact, uh, I have two questions. Yeah. <laughs> okay, make the first question is, is, is there any way to go uh, directly to a, uh, IFD not using the, this intermediation? The second, the second question is what you mean about uh, free money? Uh, the first one is easier. Um, <laughs> it's easier. We are a, a wholesaler, as I said, so we don't have uh, branches. But we have a commercial team that is able to try to help you if there is the need. So, but our help will only be about uh, if the project is eligible or is not eligible to access these funds. And then what we will say is now you have this list of uh, uh, retailers that you can work with. But we can help you on saying the project is illegible or is not illegible. Okay, about free money. Free um, money. <laughs> how do we operate? For business angels, what we do is we we uh, we uh, contract it with each of those 59 business angels uh, facility line, which is uh, I would say um, a equity facility line. So we uh, lend the money to the business angel, but the business angel will pay depending on the performance of their investments. So if the, 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 the investments go wrong, he, he, is not, uh, um, he is not liable to pay back the money. Okay? But if the things go well, we profit in partnership, pari passu, with them. Okay? And the venture capital is the same model. So uh, the only difference is, is that instead of a loan, what we do is that we have shares of the fund. Okay, so we are, we are an investor, an LP to the fund. And again, if things go well, we profit pari passu. If things go wrong, we lose pari passu. Thank you so much. You're the next speaker. Okay. Please speed it up. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Adriana. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes? Adriana Costa, and you're from the incubator. Yes, hello everybody. Welcome to our home. Um, I'm here, I don't have presentation, but I'm just here to share our experience as an incubator and as the startups that deals with these, with these matters. Um, Nowadays, things are a little bit different from 10 years ago. When we to talk about finance, we talk about banks, okay? And some incentives to create their own job, but always related with banks. Nowadays, uh, our startups, um, everything that the, my colleagues told before, I can say and I can share with you that is what happens with our startups. So starting with, we, Philip talked about the four Fs, okay, and we realized that at the beginning the startups need the four Fs. Um, nowadays, the entrepreneurs that come to us, they have less money than they had five years ago, five years before, you know. So they need other support, they need other finance to, to their project. So the incubators help these entrepreneurs to, to try to find the best way for them to get the money. At the beginning, before we talk about business angels, venture capitals, and crowdfunding, uh, they start by their own work, okay? Trying to, to have a, a low burn rate at the beginning. So we, we tell them about the incentives that they can use. And when we talk about incentives, we can talk incentives that uh, Yap May told us about, like uh, incubation voucher, like startup voucher, 
We can talk about incentives related with hiring of people. Most of startups, the, the biggest amount of the invest in investment is related with people, and there are many incentives related with this. Sometimes startups don't, don't know, but if they know and if they can use them, they can reduce the, the, the amount they need at, at the beginning. We can also, also talk about uh, the incentives of Portugal 2020, that uh, it's used for all of our startups. Of course, at the beginning, they usually use uh, um, research and development incentives, internationalization incentives, but um, to get along with these projects, they must have some money of their own, and that's where the business angels get in, and also some credit lines from the bank also get in because they have special conditions to these startups that have Portugal 2020 approvals. Um, also at the beginning, we have many companies who go to crowdfunding, okay? Like uh, my colleagues told, uh, to test the market, to test the price, and uh, to get some money at the beginning. We have some experiences, maybe five, I think maybe five of our startups had already tested this, this funding way. Um, after that, now they are starting to get in the um, loan crowdfunding and the equity crowdfunding is something r recent, okay? Maybe in the last year we are talking about these matters, but they are getting more familiar with these matters and these kind of loans. Of course, that when we talk about business angels, it's not easy for them, or it's not easy for them to get finance from business angels, okay? They must uh, have metrics, the project must have some scalability, a good business model, it must be repeatable, and sometimes it's not easy, okay? But we try to prepare them before they go to the business angels, okay? And the incubators and the incentives that exist helps them to, to present their projects to, to business angels. After business angels, we talk about venture capitals also. Uh, of course, when we're talking about startups and incubators, usually at the beginning they stay here for three years, then plus two years, so it's not very easy, sorry, to talk about venture capital in these first three years, okay? But uh, we, we keep on talking with our startups and uh, the startups that are in venture capital right now that pass through the incubator are not in the incubator already, okay, but we have the experience. This experience is very important because the entrepreneurs, they share the experience with, with each other. Relating with this project, the Alfinator, I think it's a very important project for us incubators, for us technicians, and for the entrepreneurs, because we are the ones who pass the message to the entrepreneurs, because I think the, the most difficult thing is entrepreneurs, they are too focused on their projects, and uh, they don't need to know all that exists, but they need to know where to the knock, the door to knock, okay, to, to have the answers and to help them in this, in this process. So uh, we have many, um, maybe 40% of our companies, they have uh, Portugal 2020 incentives, 30% have business angels investment, 20% went through a crowdfunding platform, so I think this was the message I wanted to share with you, that the, the, the things that my colleagues told about happens during, during our day in startups and uh, with our entrepreneurs, so if you want, if you have any questions, you can ask me. I'm trying to get up the schedule. Ditto. <laughs> Great job, thank you so much. Does anybody have a question? Oh, that's, that's good. Great job. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, this is the last presentation before we proceed to the round table and we all uh, talk to each other. Um, I'm really interested in, uh, in this story. Uh, uh, and your name is? Johnny. Johnny, thank you for helping me there. And uh, please introduce yourself and your uh, experience you. with, uh, with the funding. Thank you. I will try to be as brief as possible. Great. Um, so, um, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to, to be here. 
and I'm here on the behalf uh, of Montis. We are not an enterprise, okay? So we are a nature conservation NGO, um, non-profit uh, nature conservation NGO. So we basically depend, uh, um, we don't have a, a financial model, so we depend on the money that uh, our associates, our members put in the association. We depend on donations, but I will talk a little bit about it later. Uh, the thing is, <clears throat> We started in 2014, uh, and this, the association was created with a very specific uh, goal, that was to manage land in practice. And this was because uh, Portugal has a, a general uh, management problem when it comes to the territory, which is the abandoned land. And uh, Montes started as a, a tr uh, tr uh, someone trying to give a, a response to that. So, managed land, to boost biodiversity, especially, especially abandoned land. And um, at the time, uh, we didn't know what, how we could manage land. So the first thing we did was a, a crowdfunding to buy land so we could manage it. When you're talking about nature conservation, you need long-term results because nature doesn't work as fast as us. Um, even though we try to make it work faster, so we need time, so we, try, we decided to buy land. Right now, we are managing 160 hectares and we have four, around 400 members in the association. About financing, um, our money right now, we started uh, with the idea of not depending on projects because when the project ends, the funding ends, and uh, sometimes uh, the, the work that is being done stops and we didn't want that, so we try to rely mostly on members and donations, but uh, right now we depend, we actually depend a, a lot on money coming from projects, I mean, funded projects, especially from the EU, from the LIFE program. Um, we also depend on member fees, donations, and basically crowdfunding is, is a, a, a type of donation, so. Uh, okay, so in a total, from 2014 to the present date, we have made four crowdfunding campaigns and all of them were successful. Um, the first one, as I already uh, explained was to buy the first plot of land that we wanted to manage. We were talking about 5.5 uh, hectares of land in the mountains of Karamulu. It was a, an oak land, pretty beautiful land, so I think this helped with the first crowdfunding. But uh, the goal was to have uh, 12,000 euros and surprisingly we were able to raise, to, to raise on the first crowdfunding 1671, uh, okay, that value, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> nearly 60,000 euros uh, with a total of uh, 255 supporters. This, this was quite a, a very good start, we were very surprised with this and we didn't expect it to be so successful, so we bought the land and we saved the rest of the money to buy another land later. Then, in 2016, we decided to make a bigger crowdfunding. And this was dedicated because, okay, we already had the land, but we did not have the resources that we needed to manage land. I mean materials, I mean uh, capacity building for the volunteers. We work mostly with volunteers. We almost do not hire forest services, okay? There's a reason behind that, and I can talk to you later, it's not related with the presentation. So we decided to put up <clears throat> a second crowdfunding, and I think this one was a little bit more risky because uh, when you're talking about financing um, work or people, uh, people are not so eager to, to put money in as when you have a product or when you're buying land, I think. Uh, so we, we had the goal of 16,000 euros and we collected 17,000 with a total of 200 supporters, 201. The third one was a very small campaign, but it had a very attractive idea behind it. Um, I will explain it very briefly. Um, the, the, that is the, the drawing of a jay. A jay is a bird that picks up seeds from oaks, and they naturally store it on the ground, okay? So the idea was we made a crowdfunding to buy uh, wooden tables where we put the seeds and we just put those tables in, in places where you have no trees. So you're basically just giving the tools to the jays to pick the seeds up naturally and, and scatter them all over the territory. So um, it was a very cheap product, it was just wooden tables. And um, it was 2,300 euros, we, we overcame that value. 
with a total of 115 supporters. And this year, I mean, it, it ended two weeks ago, uh, nearly two weeks ago, we made uh, our last crowdfunding, um, which was, is called in Portuguese, como coisa que nos é cedida. In English, it's something like, like something entrusted to us. And this was the second crowdfunding we made to buy land. And uh, in this case, the total value was 29,195 euros. Um, in the beginning of the crowdfunding, when we were putting the campaign on the PPL, we received a message from the PPL saying, um, you're on your own. <laughs> they were saying, uh, please be aware that this is a very high value. The, um, the mean value of the crowdfunding that PPL has approved is around 3,000 euros. So you're pretty much on your own, okay, go ahead, but please be, be aware that it's, it's hard. And most of the, even I, I, I mean, we, when we, know, we knew this was a big risk. We we're taking a good chance. But hopefully we made the 30,060, that, that value there, 30,000 euros. So we overcame the initial value with a total of 313 supporters. Um, I think everyone was very, very uh, surprised that we, we made the value, especially because when you're talking about putting money to buy land in Portugal, especially in rural areas, um, we, we used a, a campaign in, on Facebook. We, we paid to have a, a bigger uh, vision for one of the posts that we made during the campaign, and we had hundreds of uh, trashing comments on the posts saying that we were robbing people, we, we were just, yeah, like robbing the lands and all that kind of stuff. Just, this is just to illustrate that it's, it's very rough and it's, very, it's not easy to get money for, for this cause. But I think that we, all the crowdfundings we have made before contributed to, to, to draw up the scenario to, to make this one successful. So um, on this crowdfunding, we, if, if you calculate the mean, uh, the contributions per person were higher than on the previous crowdfundings. Maybe this also has to do with the value, because the value is bigger, so I think people are more willing. If you're contributing, then you could contribute with a higher value because you're making your contribution probably worth it. It's all, uh, an all or nothing campaign. If we don't get the money, we have to give everything back to, to the donors. And if you exclude the two uh, crowdfunding, that polemic crowdfunding uh, from the nurses, um, this one was the third bigger successful crowdfunding campaign uh, in Portugal. This is a very, uh, I think this illustrates the, the way the campaign goes. So at the start, we had a, a lot of donations. We had one donation of 3,000 euros. So um, the blue line is um, the, 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 the amount of donations during the, the time of the campaign. So we had a very good uh, kickstart. And then in the, um, after, on the second, third, uh, things started going um, down, okay? So we were, able, but we were always able to keep on some small donations going, and in the end, we, we were able to raise the money. From our experience, this is uh, the type of graphic we had in all campaigns, okay? So, um, I'm not an ex uh, crowdfunding expert, okay? But from our own experience, what we can say about this, and uh, considering that we are a non-profit and nature conservation NGO, what I think that were the key factors that contributed to make this successful, I think the, the most important one was building trust. We've been working for this crowdfunding since, since the beginning of the, the association. So you can only get money from people to buy land that you are going to manage if people believe that you are transparent if, you, if people believe that they will get the feedback from, from the, the money they put in, and if, if the people believe your work. So, if you want to do something like this, build trust. Communicate, uh, show the results, say where the money is going, um, tell people what you're doing. Also, during the campaign, and uh, in the beginning of this campaign, I think this wouldn't be so important, but it, it turned out to be, always rely on the four, the four Fs. So I think we are pretty much depending on that right now. Um, 
the close relationships, the family, the friends, those are the ones that will keep your, your campaign alive. And even if you have bigger donations, probably they will come because you have a friend or someone from your family that has convinced someone else to put money in, okay? So I think that relying on that is very important. Uh, and also become personal. Uh, if you become personal, people will identify with your cause easier, but you have to know the right amount because if you get too personal, people will feel, un will feel uncomfortable and will not be in the mood to put money in. And um, in the end, you should always keep the campaign alive. Sometimes uh, we had events during the two months of the crowdfunding, we had a lot of events. Some of them, uh, if you make the math and you calculate the, the amount of money you put in to, to prepare the event and the amount of money you collected for the crowdfunding, you're losing money. But immediately, if you look at it immediately, but the return from that is that you have people that will share your campaign, that will advertise it to their friends. So keeping the campaign alive is very, very important. And always communicate it uh, on your communication channels. Either if it's a blog or a Facebook or the website, always keep the campaign alive. And that's pretty much what I had to bring you. And you have my contact there, but we'll have time to, to talk after. Thank you. Very impressive. And the first thing I want to tell you is you told uh, us that you are not a crowdfunding campaign, but you are a crowdfunding uh, expert, I mean. Uh, so I think it's very important also with the goal we have uh, with this workshop today is uh, you should really uh, consider yourself an expert and, and share your, uh, your lessons learned because that will help so many others. Very impressive. Yeah. Um, now we move on to the, to the round table. So I would uh, like to invite all speakers to come and uh, pick a seat and we'll um, see if we can... Uh,